Deadly floods in Pakistan, record heat waves from the US to China, glaciers collapsing in India and Europe, and drought pushing millions towards famine in East Africa. Extreme weather events hit almost every part of the world in 2022. Clear signs of a rapidly warming planet and a rapidly closing window for action. But there was some important progress. The US passed its first ever climate legislation. The Americans and Chinese restarted their climate change talks. Australia and Brazil elected pro-climate action governments. And at COP27 in Egypt, a breakthrough agreement on a loss and damage fund was signed, a step towards helping vulnerable nations cope with devastating climate impacts. The topic moves to 2023, with part of the focus on the COP28 talks in the all-rich UAE, where discussions will likely centre on fossil fuels, fairness and finance. Right, for more, let's speak now with Professor Mark Howden, the Director of Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions at the Australian National University, and Rachel Basner Kerr, Professor of Global Development at Cornell University. Thank you both for joining us. Now, Professor Howden, let me start with you first. It's been a busy 12 months in terms of extreme weather events. Can we conclusively say these have been clear evidence of the effects of climate change and should be bracing for more of such climate and environmental shocks in 2023? Yeah, there's in increased evidence that uh, the events that we're seeing have uh, increased their probability due to climate change. Uh, the fingerprint of climate change of temperature increase is actually embedded in these key events that we've seen, uh, the floods and fires that we've seen in this past year. And, and clearly, uh, climate change is an ongoing factor and, and that will result in increased likelihood of significant, severe, extreme events in this forthcoming year. So, so I think we need to be uh, gearing ourselves up for a lot more of this bad news. Uh, Professor Kerr, there have been some more pessimistic observers who say we've gone too far to prevent global temperatures from rising beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. Do you share their view or do you believe we still have a chance to reverse the worst impact of our actions that have sort of taken a toll on global warming? I don't share that bleak pessimistic outlook. I do think there is still a small but important window where we have time to reduce, significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and keep the temperature below the 1.5 degrees Celsius that uh, the IPCC and uh, other uh, scientific bodies have emphasized is really crucial for ensuring that we don't see even more uh, severe impacts from climate change. Mm -hmm. Professor Kerr, uh, turning to major global efforts, we saw a conclusion of COP27 in Egypt. You've uh, participated in the climate conference, uh, I understand, which saw some progress in terms of loss and damage negotiations, but less uh, when it comes to curbing the use of coal, for example. I mean, what's your honest assessment of COP27? The historic decision to uh, take action around loss and damage is a cause for optimism. Uh, but I agree with the assessment that there was not enough done to really uh, curb greenhouse gas emissions. And the presence of the fossil fuel industry lobbyists at COP27 was alarming and I think uh, makes us want to put pressure more on governments to really take seriously uh, what scientific reports are, are calling loud and clear for the need for serious reduction in greenhouse gas emissions as uh, number one priority. And Professor Howden, with that in mind then, what are some of the critical things that need to be achieved at COP28 in Dubai and in the build-up to it to ensure some real progress in fighting climate change occurs? Well, I think uh, as Professor um, Besner Kerr actually said that there really does need to be a, a strong focus on emission reductions. Uh, that's the core of this issue. And uh, at the moment, whilst there is some progress in some countries, it's not occurring at the global scale at the pace that's needed. And so I think that has to be a critical part of next year's COP. Uh, as well as that, obviously, there's going to be ongoing issues to do with finance, uh, with the implementation of the loss and damage uh, agenda, um, with food security and agriculture 
culture, uh, which was started and kicked off at COP27, uh, but also with the uh, whole array of other things, including the carbon trading arrangements um, that are needed to uh, ensure that there's not double counting and uh, um, problematic dealings in that system. So there's a lot of work to do. And uh, it's not impossible to actually do it at the scale and the timing um, that's needed to actually address climate change in the way that the science actually says it needs to be addressed. Uh, but it is increasingly challenging as every year goes by because every year really matters when it comes to climate change. Mm, absolutely. And Professor Howden, and there have been some interesting technological developments in 2022 that, that could be a sort of a boon to the environment, including the recent news of a breakthrough in nuclear fusion. Uh, but what other technology stood out for you and should we be encouraged by progress in the clean tech sector? Look, there's, there's uh, progress being made every day, um, but uh, and in spite of the enthusiasm about the, the fusion uh, result, uh, that's still a long way away from being implementable at the scale that's needed to address climate change. Uh, we need to make massive progress in terms of decarbonising our systems in the next decade, and uh, and it's very unlikely we're going to see fusion rolling out in that decade. Uh, that, that was a, just a very initial research finding. So the, the really big message here is, is that renewables and storage are getting cheaper day by day, and, and that is the big hope in terms of rapid decarbonisation and rapid reduction in emissions. Now, some progress in other sectors, uh, including things like agriculture and reductions in methane, they're very positive, um, but they're relatively small compared with the, the change from a fossil fuel-based economy or economies into something which is much more renewable, and that's where the big game is. Mm. Professor Besnikur, the impact on climate change has significant consequences, not just to human life that gets caught up in extreme weather events, but also the impact it has on food production and our ability to sustain life following them. The floods in Pakistan would be an example of this. Absolutely. And one of the key messages coming out of our Working Group 2 uh, report, uh, the chapter on food systems, was that climate change is impacting, there, there's robust evidence that climate change is impacting food systems around the world, both in terms of agricultural productivity being affected, but also the fisheries and oceans, and even the underlying e ecosystems that are supporting our food production. So things like the bees that pollinate our, our uh, crops. And extreme events like the floods in Pakistan can lead to short-term, very uh, catastrophic food production losses and uh, are now increasingly in the literature being directly connected with acute events of food insecurity around the world. So uh, we're definitely feeling the impacts of food systems and pro projecting forward if we don't take significant action to really transform our food systems to not rely on fossil fuels themselves and to use more ecological processes for growing food, we can anticipate even more severe impacts, including hitting the pocketbook in terms of the price of food in the, in the future. And uh, Professor Howden, such grave and complex threats posed by climate change need a comprehensive and, of course, a fair plan. Just how much leadership and what sort of legislative and policy responses will be enough to protect our environment? <clears throat> oh, that's uh, uh, the, the big question. So what we see uh, are multiple issues here um, connecting with each other. So there's the climate change issue and biodiversity issue, uh, equity and justice issues across the globe, as well as the immediate economic ones we're seeing. And, and brought together as a package, it, it does actually make it extraordinarily difficult to plot a way forward at the pace that's needed to deal with climate change. So what I think we need to do is actually start to look at policy options and practices uh, that actually meet multiple objectives. So uh, where responses to climate change also in encourage good responses or effective responses to biodiversity. Um, they also generate regional uh, economic development. They also reduce our greenhouse gas emissions profile. And so I think what we need to do is be starting to think about really smart policy responses that achieve multiple goals at once because we have to achieve on all of these different areas and particularly those areas relating to equity and justice because they're core to many achievements elsewhere.
Mm. Yeah, with that in mind, speaking about equity and justice, uh, Professor Besnikur, how can we make the fight against climate change a fair one? We see richer nations that are mostly responsible for emissions and temperature rises have better resources to cope with them than the poorer ones that often bear the brunt. Absolutely. So this is a, a key aspect of taking action, working with and listening to those voices, those groups that are most affected by climate change. And that's where we see the most promise for transformative change. So uh, the wealthier countries need to step up and show leadership putting money where they put commitments and increasing the commitments to address adaptation needs as well as mitigation and listening to those groups that are most impacted by climate change. Uh, so it's really going to take vision and collaboration and a, a close attention to equity and justice if we're going to really transform the way we, the way we organize society. Well, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for your time and expertise on this very important topic. Uh, Professor Mark Howden from the Australian National University and Rachel Basner-Kerr from Cornell University. Thank you.